Hello and welcome back and that's right today we're looking at a new SSD it's been a while hasn't it since we were looking at gen 4 SSDs or something of a hiatus you know because of the whole gen 5 SSD explosion that was summer 2023 but Today I want to talk about this, the Verbatim VI700G. Now you heard me right, this is a Verbatim SSD. Verbatim, the CD people, yes, they are in the Gen 4 market. Hell, they're in the Gen 3 market. They have actually produced several SSDs over the years. You know, they've been in data for a long time. And I will say, of all of the Gen 4 solutions that I have talked about on this channel in the last 18 months, I hate seagulls, there they are. Um, I would say this is one of the more intriguing examples. Why is that? Because the hardware architecture was not what I expected. It borrows from a number of different SSDs in the market right now, utilizing third-party components that everyone else is using, but not the ones you would predict. Now, this device arrives as SSD for in 1TB format and 2TB format. Format. We're looking at the 1TB today, and again, that will knock you knock you back about 70, maybe to 80 nicker, depending where you are in the world, based on your currency conversion and your tax on top. Now, in this video, we're going to talk about the hardware. We're obviously going to unbox it, take a little look at the components, get that heatsink off, have a good old look at the components inside and discuss everything in there, and then we're going to do some performance benchmarks so at the end of the video on a PC. We're not doing PS5 benchmarks on this unless you guys want PS5 benchmarks on this. If you do let me know in the comments and we'll do another video benchmarking this on a playstation 5 like we did a bunch of other ssds in the past but what do you get for that money what are you getting for that why why should you not be looking at your wd blacks your seagate fire cudas your samsung 980 pros what exactly is this bringing to the table that they don't have so inside again packaging fairly standard i would ask it's a bit dull the packaging and i know that's not important, it's what's on the inside that matters, thank you mother. But, when it comes to an SSD that is boasting utilisation in, in PC or PS5 environment, although there are the content creators out there, drives like this are pretty much targeted at gamers. Yes, if, you know, 4K, even coming up on 8K editors can take advantage of the bandwidth of Gen 4 SSDs. But this is going to be for gamers, and this is quite a bland presentation all the way around we've got with this drive. Now inside, I've already opened it up and the reasons for that will become clear later on. Um, inside, what do we get? Uh, we get uh, the SSD itself and we get our instruction uh, manual, how to install it and information on the five years included warranty. We've got nothing else in that box. So that's the unboxing portion out of the way. And we've got the drive itself. And again, it's incredibly understated the SSD. It does have a proprietary heatsink included, which is nice, but it is quite a kind of quiet, modest release of an SSD here, the verbatim. Now, the heatsink is ever so slightly different to ones that I've seen out there, and you're going to hear me say the words ever so slightly different a lot in this video, by the way. Um, it, one, it's incredibly low profile. Only really the next storage SSD that we talked about on the channel a while ago, I would say has got a similar profile in height, yet density there on that heat. It's a good slab of um, heat dissipation there on top, held it in a bracket all the way around. And that brings me to my first point about this when it comes to the capacity. This is the 1TB model with inclusive heatsink there. And again, the 2TB model, again, knocks around for about 130 to 150, again, depending where you are in the world. But even this 1TB model has got four NAND chips inside. Now, quick lesson here on the side. Come a bit closer. When you are putting storage inside and on an SSD, the actual data has to reside on big chips there the big ones there known as nand that is where your data lives so we'll leave that off for a bit the nand the size of that nand will differ depending on the drive capacity so in this case being a 1tb the majority of a nas brands in the market would release a 1tb with two nand chips inside two 512 gigabyte nand chips which would then add up to one terabyte of capacity this, on the other hand, has four. It has four NAND chips inside for one TB. That's 256 gig NAND 
each and that, that spreads out the data accordingly across the NAND. The result of which is when you have an SSD that has NAND more evenly distributed across multiple cells, the result is the read and write performance is often significantly better. In the case of this, this one, uh, sorry, this uh, one TB drive at sequential read boasts 7,400 maximum performance megabytes per second sequential read. So 7,400 megs at that price point is staggeringly high. That is top end. And although the write performance is a bit more middling at the 1 TB at um, 5,500, which is pretty much what everyone has at that level, and the 2 TB at 6,700, that uh, sequential read of 7,400 megabytes per second is pretty dang substantial there. So a number of you might be wondering, with the NAND distribution inside on those four cells, what is the controller inside this that's getting the job done? Again, history lesson, come over here. When it comes to SSDs, yes, the data lives on those big fat NAND modules, but we've also got a couple of other cells down here. And the one we need to talk about is the one on the end there. That's the controller. Now, the controller on an SSD is like the CPU on your computer. It's where everything's being done. And that inside this is not the Fizon. Everyone, myself included, assumed that this verbatim SSD, the V1-7000G, uh, would be your standard Fizon E18 controller, 10 a penny, everyone's rocking at these days. It's not. It's the InnoGrit Rainer, the IG5236, uh, a controller I've only ever seen in about three, maybe four common ground SSDs at the moment. The uh, Patriot Viper VP4300 uh, and the A-Data XPG S and X70 Blade series. The Integrated Rainer controller, although not as ubiquitous as the um, E18 from Fizon, actually boasts better power utilization. And overall, that Integrate controller is how this drive across those four NAND cells is able to hit that 7,400 sequential read. You're gonna need a powerful PC, and I very much doubt my um, 11th, 12th Gen i5, I can't quite remember system over there, is gonna be able to hit those benchmarks, but still nonetheless, it's still gonna do dang well. And in terms of IOPS, that Rainer controller unfortunately doesn't hit the same IOPS numbers as we've seen from the Fizon E18. Uh, with the 1TB, uh, 600,000 4K random IOPS read, over 800,000 um, or 800K uh, write 4K random IOPS. Now the 2TB model, slightly better at 800K read 4K random and uh, write 4K random, it crosses into the million. So good numbers. But there are other SSDs in the market that are cranking 1.5, close to 2 million. A data themselves with the same controller uh, boast a 2 million IOPS factor there. Now, when it comes to uh, the, uh, not 2 million, 1.8, sorry. Um, when it comes to durability on this drive, that's an, another slightly mixed bag. Because in terms of uh, durability, the 1TB has a reported 500, I seriously hate seagulls, 500 terabytes written uh, per year um, durability. And the 2TB are just 700 terabytes written. Now that sounds like a lot, right? Well, the same architecture we're seeing in this with the NAND, which I should have mentioned, is a 128 layer NAND, 3D TLC NAND, and the memory is one gig and two gig on the one TB and two TB respectively, DDR4 memory. If you really want to get technical, it is the dr 4 d 4 g 18 hmb model ID memory. That's right, I got my magnifying glass out and everything. Um, the durability on this, unlike the A data, which rocks numbers like 740TB and 1480TB for the 1TB and 2TB respectively. This is, you know, in some cases, up to half the durability there. And again, I'm not 100% certain. All I can imagine it's to do with is the distribution of smaller NAND across more cells. And ultimately, although that can benefit uh, performance, it can lead question marks to durability sometimes, particularly when you're not rocking the latest 176 layer NAND that we're seeing more brands utilizing, but this seemingly arriving with that 128 layer 3D TLC NAND. Ultimately, 
This is a drive that manages to give you peak performance, but the reason its price point, despite its newness, is quite reasonable comparative to the others out there, is because of the way the components have been geared, and that integrated controller, by the way, as well, which avoids a little bit more of the monopoly price tagging of the Fison controller, Still, nonetheless, it's not a completely perfect SSD as far as the spec sheets tell us. But for now, what we're going to do is get this plugged into our test machine over there and start running our crystal disk, our Atto, and more, just to see what this um, SSD is capable of. And here we are on the desktop of my test machine here. As we can see, there's the drive on the right-hand side. Uh, as we can see, we're running it on Gen 4x4 lane there. We've got no restrictions. Same goes with the NVMe Express standard. We even did a provisional test on one gig file. I'll go into more detail about that later on. But even with some very early testing there, in our initial one gig test file in Crystal Dismart, we immediately exceeded 7,000 megs and got close to that 5,500 megs that they said this drive maxes out at, at 1 TB. And again, that was just our original test on this system. Talking of this system, uh, let's talk a little bit about the hardware of the rig that we're running here. This is a 12th gen Intel i5, 16 gig of DDR5 memory there, and again, Although we don't have a GPU card inside in the Windows 10 Pro system, this is more than enough to get the job done on this. This is a Gen 5 system, and we're utilizing this Gen 4 drive in a Gen 5 slot. A Gen 4 drive in a Gen 5 slot, even. Uh, so we've got more than enough hardware to be going along with. However, it's worth highlighting that we are recording this in OBS, as you can see there on screen, which will impact results, especially on write, more so than read. So we never run OBS during the test. So what I'll be doing shortly while performing all of our tests in each of the respective bits of software is going through all of the results with two to three tests with every app. We're going to be running multiple crystal disk mark tests. We're going to be running several Atto disk benchmark tests. Bear in mind, every time I open one of these up, you're going to see a slight black screen there. And we'll be running a test with Atto, Chris, uh, Atto disk benchmark. We'll also be running AS uh, for more tests here. And again, that will be utilizing that drive there. And all of these tests will be running back to back just to put this drive through its paces somewhat. But the reason, again, as mentioned, that we're going to be fast forwarding about an hour for you guys, because if we go ahead and rerun the crystal disk test, so that one on the left here was conducted when OBS wasn't running. With OBS running here in the background, and we run that exact same test here, and we start the test, we'll put those side by side. You'll notice that probably, and again, this is an assumption, that the numbers you're going to see during um, OBS running are going to be impacted. As you can see, we've already seen a drop of around 250 megabytes here. Actually, it's around 300 just don't shy of that um so we want to make sure that all of the test results we see are pretty much on the money there in between and although i could use an external capture card to get these tests done i do still believe that um the, the external capture card when we have utilized it in the past has still utilized an impact there for the signal being sent to an external device with the obs but we're just going to wait for that uh, initial right benchmark to come through there and again not too different there but we definitely saw an impact so Although we're going to keep that there on screen because that is still a real test. I'm going to go ahead for about an hour. It's uh, 8.22 a.m. on the 16th of, uh, of June. I'm going to go ahead and start performing all of these tests. So let's fast forward uh, just around about an hour and go through the performance benchmarks of the verbatim i700G. Okay, so we are back now where we've gone through a bunch of our tests. So let's go through those results. So first of all, let's go through those crystal disk results from early. We tested a 256, a 1 gig, and a 4 gig test file here. And I will say straight away, those are some good numbers for us here. We only really exceeded the 7,000 megs there on the 1 gig test file, but still nonetheless, we got incredibly close on this. And given that the benchmarks given to us from verbatim are based on substantially more um, high-performing processes and setups than the one we're utilizing, these are still great numbers. And we still saw write speeds there in excess of 5,200 megabytes per second. And even on the mixed results, we still saw some great numbers overall. Um, I would, the only thing I would highlight throughout the course of these tests um, is to do with those IOPS figures. Um, they're weirdly higher than uh, actually stated by the brand themselves on those IOPS figures. Uh, this one, you know, just shy uh, or just over 900,000 there in 4K read IOPS, 4K random. 
which, you know, if I was uh, verbatim, I'd probably boast a little higher about those numbers. Uh, if we make our way now into um, Atto Disk Benchmark, we've got three tests within Atto there, a 256, a 1 gig, and a 4 gig test file again. Um, and when it comes to those uh, byte numbers there, you can see just there, just on the verge in terms of right of that 5 gigabyte, do bear in mind that the mathematics um, for the actual modular megabytes and gigabytes in Atto is slightly different to other benchmarking tools there so it'll always appear slightly lower but that's only because of the mathematics of working out rather than individual megabytes that it actually calculates it to the gigabyte but still nonetheless consistently high numbers there and I think a big part of that is that you know grip controller uh, having just a better balance point and obviously the NAND distribution across those four cells has played its part too across all of those tests now if we look at the IOPS the IOPS again very hard to read here within Atto, and I think they're a little bit clearer there on Crystal Disk, but still pretty reasonable numbers overall for the benchmark testing we're doing here. Remember, when a lot of people do these tests, they're normally utilizing significantly smaller file blocks for random than we are showing here, when these are based on sequential benchmarks there overall. And finally, we make our way onto ASSSD, another tool that kind of has its own uh, metric, but I will say between the one three and five gigabyte test files there i know they seem lower than what you've seen before but as ssd benchmarks always have a slightly lower appearing number and overall i'd still say those are great numbers overall for what we are seeing um, now throughout the course of those tests it's worth highlighting that once again as we mentioned earlier it is an ssd that has an onboard heatsink we didn't remove it um, with that heatsink we can make our way into the graph figure there and we can make our way into the temperature of that ssd over time so there is our measured time there of the ssd and thanks to that heat sink we're going for this one here we can see that temperature only peaked at 47 degrees there so although it was running a little hot during i will say that overall those benchmark figures are still pretty darn good for what we were sort of putting this ssd through we weren't going to the dizzy heights of 16 gig or anything like that but still very good numbers overall for that ssd and ultimately i think this only goes to kind of uh, underline that point about this verbatim ssd kind of giving you a lot of the high-end performance of some of the more expensive ssds at least at their launch and although verbatim doesn't have the reputation in this arena that we've talked about before i will say let's bring that up there on the graph um that their their entry into this gen 4 field is still pretty solid indeed and although it lacks the durability of some of the other drives there on the market i will say the right performance is a little lower uh, than some of the ones out there as well overall um if you're seeing this on a good offer certainly go for it and even if it's at the original close to rrp price it's a pretty good ssd to be opting for even if it does it, it kind of looks and feels more like an OEM drive, but it is a PC and PS5 performance drive for gamers too. But thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed today's review of the Verbatim VI 700, uh, 7000G. The written review should be coming soon below, and we will be introducing this into comparisons with some of the bigger boys at Seagate, WD, and Samsung very, very soon. But apart from that, thank you so much for watching. Subscribe for more SSD reviews. And other than that, I will see you next time.